What happens when you take the video market boom of the 80s and 90s, the category three golden age of Hong Kong exploitation and place it in the hands of a businessman. Hi, my name's Rob and welcome to my channel where we explore the wonders of East Asian cinema. Today, the films of Godfrey Ho. What is that? Hang on in there, you'll find out. We often see the 90s as the golden age of Hong Kong cinema, and in many ways it was. The new wave of directors making slick action films, filmmakers like Wu, Hark and Lam, all helped establish what we now think of as Hong Kong action cinema. The reality is though, that this era of Hong Kong cinema was an oversaturated pile of mediocre exploitation, run and gun filmmaking. Of course, many of the greats emerged here, like the directors I mentioned before, but they was the anomaly, not the normality. There was a ton of forgettable garbage as the market was flooded with anything and everything. One of these filmmakers was Godfrey Ho. Ho feels like the combination of Roger Corman and Ed Wood. For him, cinema is a business where anything and everything that can help sell your film or give it a unique selling point or keep its production costs low is fair game. I work fast and I'm a deal. I write and direct and I'm good. The quality of the film doesn't matter. What matters is how many tickets and VHS can it sell. This business mentality is no surprise as Ho weren't the trade whilst working with the Shaw Brothers. If you're not familiar with the Shaw Brothers, they essentially created an assembly line style of filmmaking in Hong Kong that allowed them to churn out films. Many martial arts films at a rapid rate with low costs and high profits. However, the Shaw Brothers to some extent still had a level of quality that was upheld, for the most part anyway. However, Ho did not. Steamed crap. So basically you have Ho appearing in this period of Hong Kong cinema where the demand for national films is at an all time high and the amount of films being produced is also at an all time high. So for independent filmmakers like himself, you have to do anything to make the most profit and get your films seen. So as a result, Ho creates some pretty interesting films. One method Ho frequently used was the splicing method. You see, Ho realized that buying cheap unreleased or unfinished films was cheaper than actually shooting films. And simply shooting enough scenes to add into those unfinished films was again cheaper than shooting any entire film. So, he would splice together two films and redub them to be coherent, or at least as close to coherent as he could get. For example, the Korean film, The Uninvited Guest, gets spliced together with footage of ninjas and you get Ninja Terminator. Ninjas were Ho's trademark, he believed them to be a guaranteed seller no matter what, so he made a fair few films about ninjas. I have to reform the ninja empire! Ninja Terminator, The Ninja Squad, Challenge of the Ninja, Full Metal Ninja, Ninja Dragon, and the list goes on. Richard Harrison was often his choice of ninja protagonist as well to give the films an international appeal, although what appeal Harrison brought is still up for debate. Go to hell! So he would buy the cheapest martial arts films he could find, then he would shoot about 15 minutes worth of ninja footage with Richard Harrison, slap it all together and call it something with the word ninja in the title and hope for the best. As a result, the films are incoherent, messy, but unintentionally hilarious. His posters alone are often gold mines of humour as he would often place already existing characters on the posters to catch audiences. From Robocop on the Robo Vampire poster, to Stallone on the Clash of Ninja poster. Obviously these characters were not in the film, nor was the copyright for their likeness probably ever acquired. Ho didn't always do this though, he did make some real films, I say real films, take it lightly. Films like Lethal Panther, which feels more like a traditional Hong Kong action film of the 90s. It's not good, but it makes a little more sense than Harrison dressed as a ninja. Yes, that's my ninja star. He also directed the sequel to the cult classic propaganda film Men Behind the Sun, in which he shows real footage of an autopsy, again as a way to create a unique selling point for his film. Ho would do absolutely anything to sell his films. He would often change his own name on the credits, and he has apparently used over 40 different names, using aliases such as Ed Wu, possibly in attempts to cash in on the John Wu craze. Who really knows? 
But this is the world of Ho. These films were meant to just catch your eye, take your money, and then fade away into obscurity. Names, story, plots, and characters didn't matter. It was about making money. What is most interesting about Ho and his filmography is that it encapsulates a moment of Hong Kong cinema perfectly. He is the antithesis to the predominant image we have of slick gangster action films with Chow Yun Fat lighting cigarettes off counterfeit dollar bills. He showcases the reality of the mediocrity that dominated the oversaturated market of Hong Kong cinema at the time, and he also connotes the reality of the handover as Ho's career ultimately fades away once the handover is done. You see, when Hong Kong goes back to China in 1997, we know the story of filmmakers like Wu and Lam who go over to America or the mainland to work with China. But for many like Ho, that is not a possibility. He makes category 3 action films filled with sex, blood and guts. China doesn't want that. He also isn't known enough to go to America and his style of cinema just can't survive in the post handover climate. Hence, his career slowly fades away and his approach to filmmaking is no longer possible. So very difficult to survive. Before we make uh, 3 million or 4 million, we can, we, we can sell to China for 1 million. But now no more, because the, the distributor there, they, they produce by themselves. They know need to buy your movie though. So that's why one territory we lost, and big territory as a matter of fact. This is a reality for many filmmakers and studios during the time, which is another reason Ho so strongly acts as a perfect example of Hong Kong filmmaking in the 80s and 90s, as he represents something that is often forgotten about Hong Kong cinema and the business world of it. Exploring his filmography now is fun, you can find films that are just boring and hard to watch, but you can also find some surprisingly fun films where everything is so bad it just kind of works. So I highly recommend catching some of his films if you can, I think you might enjoy it and find a few laughs if you do. I hope you guys enjoyed this video anyway, I'm sorry that I've really just not been putting out as many videos as I would like, I've just been really busy with university work and just my, you know, my job and that kind of thing, so it, it is quite hard to make these videos sometimes, so please, please, please like, comment and subscribe and just share the video around. And, just do all those positive things that so many of you already do because it does really really help to give me that drive to find the extra time to make these videos and engage with you all and have some fun. Um, if any of you are even still watching, I am also thinking about Twitch streaming soon as a way for you to come and just we can all just chat and play some games. I'm thinking about going through the Yakuza games because, I don't know, thematically I guess it makes sense for the channel and um, we can just play through them, relax and chat about films in the chat and just if there's anything you've ever wanted to hear my opinion on certain films or anything like that it would just be a great way to to engage and create a little community together so thanks again for watching guys i do really appreciate it and i love all the feedback i get on the videos so thanks for watching and i'll see you guys on the next one